I am so excited to be joined today by the beautiful Whitney Lauritsen, a uh, really amazing uh, entrepreneur, uh, does a whole heap of stuff in the wellness coaching space. She's also a social media advisor, and she's also the founder of Vegan, uh, what is it, uh, that vegan, Eco Vegan Girl. I got to get it right. You can check it out on Instagram. Um, so she's doing a lot of cool things. This interview is going to be part one of part two. So this first part, we're going to be talking about well-being coaching. And then part two, we're going to look at a little bit more social media marketing and how to understand that world as well. But I'm really interested to dive into the uh, the wellness space with you as well. So Whitney, thank you so much for being with us today. I really appreciate your time. Uh, where are you based in the world at the moment, by the way? I live in Los Angeles. Oh, you're in LA. Nice. Are you in yeah. LA? Yeah. I I'm in the Hollywood area. Okay, nice. So actually, like right underneath the Hollywood sign, which wow. is pretty cool. Yeah, beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the the last overseas trip I did was to the U.S. We did a big tour up and down the the west coast of of L.A. and San Fran and San Diego, and then went back in January of uh, 2020, just before coronavirus actually broke out. And I spent a bit of time in L.A. doing some more events and retreats. So it's it's a pretty crazy place. Have you always been there? No, I grew up on the other side of the country in Massachusetts, okay. and I had big dreams of being on camera. Okay. <laughs> and when I was growing up, YouTube didn't exist. So I was just thinking like traditional filmmaking yeah. and TV stuff. And then I got into filmmaking and that was my profession for some time, wow. which brought me out to Los Angeles in 2003, I think is when I moved here. Okay. Okay, so we're, yeah. we're, we're 17, 18 years on from that moment. So congratulations. Most people only spend <laughs> about a year or two in LA before they go home. Yeah. So well done. Um, yeah. So you made that trip out. I'm interested to know the origin story from a wellness coaching perspective. How did how did you stumble upon it? I mean, LA is obviously the mecca when it comes to these types of things. Um, you know, I was there recently and, and there's, there's a million and one things that are happening right now. But I imagine 17, 18 years ago, very different place. So give me a bit of an idea in terms of how you came to be a, a wellness coach? Well, there's two big elements of my journey. One was working through disordered eating. Okay. And so I had to pay a lot of attention to my mindset and my body mm. and self-acceptance, mm. self-worth, all of those things were coming up. I was, I guess, uh, fortunate in that I had the intuitive hit to seek help when I was in college yeah. and I went and saw a few different doctors and a, eventually a therapist who guided me through the mental work involved with overcoming the disordered eating and really understanding the root of it. Mm -hmm. And I had been passionate about psychology mm -hmm. when I was in high school. So even though I was majoring and focused on filmmaking, in college, I also minored in psychology and, and it, I always thought that that was just an interest, like something yeah. that would kind of weave in personally, but also in my screenwriting, yeah. but it ended up both of those things, my passion for psychology, my experience with disordered eating guided me towards what I do now, mm -hmm. as well as my decision to go vegan, which also happened in 2003. So before I moved to LA, I started the plant-based diet and got very passionate about it. Yeah. So I came out to LA, was working in the film industry. And back then being vegan was more acceptable in Los Angeles than it was back in Massachusetts, but still nowhere what it is today. So yeah. you're right. Like I've seen so much change in the past 18 years here. And then of course, social media, I think has opened all of our eyes to so much more than yeah. maybe we just didn't see before. Yeah, 100%. Talk to me about the decision to go vegan. Um, I was vegan actually for a period of time, particularly when I very first started this business. So that would have been maybe 20, 20, uh, early 2020, uh, sorry, early 2010, not 2020, um, early 2010 into 2013, 2014, for probably like two or three years, I was vegetarian vegan during that period. Um, and I did it off the basis of doing a Tony Robbins event and just understanding a little bit more about alkalinity and a little bit more acidity and just going, okay, cool, I'm going to try this. And I originally tried it for, um, for, for 90 days and then I decided to stay with it. And then I've gone back to eating meat now. Um, but at that point, there was some interesting reasons. And people traditionally either make the decision from an animal health perspective or from a health perspective, right? So, um, and I, my sister's a vegan now. Um, so tell me a little bit about what was the inspiration behind that? Was it mental health based? Was it from, a, from the emotional eating capacity? Like what was the driver for that? Well, it ended up being 
all of those things and more, right. but honestly, the original inspiration was having a crush on somebody who was vegan. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, it was kind of one of those who maybe if I try this, he'll be yeah. more interested in me type yeah. of things. Um, but it ended up becoming so much more than that. And that's just right. like the silly origin story part of it. Um, but you know, uh, having feelings for people can cause us yeah. to make really big changes in our lives. So I'm really awesome. grateful for that. Yeah. And also for my experiences with disordered eating and my mental challenges with my body, uh, I found a lot of empowerment in going plant-based and it was exciting. It was fascinating to me. And I, I'm a big researcher. So from my entire life, I've been a big book reader and I just dove into all the books about vegan living and it lined with me on every single level. And that's why I've stuck with it all these years. Wow. Fantastic. I think there's actually something that's quite important in that. Obviously you already had the predisposition of being, you know, quite self-educated prior to becoming a vegan, but I know that for me, you know, I grew up obviously traditional British household, you know, it was basically you had meat and veg. That was it. Right. So going vegan meant you just had veg and there's no meat. <laughs> so, you know, it took a while to sort of educate, you know, if, if you go to, you know, an Indian culture, for example, or re really any Asian culture, it's traditionally a lot more vegetable based than, than protein based because there's not as much readiness supply of protein, right? And when I say protein, I'm talking about your know, animal protein. So it took a bit of self-education, but for someone that's looking to become vegan, how important it is, how important is it that somebody that goes from eating meat their whole life now goes vegan, has to self-educate through a process of understanding how to be a really well-informed and healthy vegan, because I know plenty of junk food vegans, right? Where they're much unhealthier than if they were eating meat. Uh, you know, I, there's a trade-off in that, but they haven't educated themselves. They don't understand the, the, the balance of what they actually now need to put in their body that they were getting readily from meat. So what's your thoughts and take on that? I think so much of my philosophy with the work that I do is based in tuning inwards and the intuitive guidance that we have. And a lot of us just aren't even that connected emotionally to food. We eat to your point, what we were given as children, we yes. eat what's easy, what's convenient, what's marketed towards us. And, yes. and in general, people are just not really thinking that much about what they're eating. Yes. And some people think a lot about what they're eating and get very opinionated and they put on the blinders and don't even yes. open their eyes to other things. So food is a fascinating journey for each of us. And I say that if you just start little by little and take note of your personal experience along the journey, that's where you learn. Mm -hmm. And then if you are inclined to dig in more, then there's so much information out there. I mean, yeah. and the, the great thing that I think we've found through the trends of veganism is there's so many cookbooks, so many YouTube channels, podcasts, you name it there's a source of information out there. So, and plus pretty much every restaurant, you know, minus a few exceptions ha will have something for you to eat, even if it's a basic salad. So yeah. you're not going to starve. You just have to open your eyes and get creative to your point. It might, it might be for some people cutting out the meat and just eating the vegetables, mm -hmm. but then over time you learn to get creative and there's so many incredible meals you can make and cuisines to your point too, from all around the world. Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting one. It's exciting. So from a well-being perspective, you know, if, if I'm a client that's coming to you with a particular problem, right, whether it be wellness, well-being, maybe, maybe I've got, you know, I, I'm interested to know what type of challenges the clients normally come to you with. Is it a recommendation on your part for most of them to go down the vegan uh, lifestyle aspect, or is that really just a, t a case by case basis? it works for you uh, do you find that it has a lot of benefits to a lot of people outside of that i mean interest know what your 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 uh, your take is on that i'm very passionate about helping people make the decision that feels right for them mm. and i've noticed through all these years of being vegan a lot of people get afraid of being judged for eating animal products and my aim is to guide people to feel good and do something sustainably um, and meaning not just eco-friendly, but also just something that they can continue doing for the long run. As you know, consistency is one of the most important things. Yeah. And for me, guiding somebody towards decisions that they can easily do so that they can notice how it's affecting them and then stick with it in the long run is really important. I mean, so many people make food decisions or any sort of lifestyle decision out of like wanting to get the short-term results, but 
we all know that the, that kind of immediate gratification may not last a long time mm -hmm. unless you set yourself up for success and you really want it if it really resonates with you. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of experimenting. So if somebody wants to experiment with eating plant-based, I think that's a great way to go. And then if they feel good about it on all the different levels, mentally, physically, and emotionally, then maybe they'll stick with it in the long run. And certainly for me and the research I've done, I found that it does have some phenomenal benefits for your entire well-being but if you're feeling forced and limited then that's going to drag you down you're going to feel stressed you're going to feel unfulfilled and i wouldn't want somebody to experience that yeah well 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 put um talk to me about the type of clients that you traditionally work with as a as a wellness and well-being coach who are the type of people you traditionally attract and give me a bit of an idea in terms of your business model like what, how do you support clients in in that space i know you've got a podcast i know you've just written a, a, a vegan keto cookbook as well um so give me a bit of an insight in terms of if i'm looking to work with you as a client what does that journey look like well, it starts with having a conversation and, and really seeing how much somebody can open up about what they're going through. And I think people that I typically attract are very heart centered. They're somebody that is sensitive and wants support and knows that they need it. Mm -hmm. And one of my strengths as I, my personality has always kind of been that person you could go to and confide in and that that really guided me towards the career that I have now is, is being non-judgmental and, and accepting somebody as they are and, and figuring out what can I do to support them. And that brings me probably the greatest joy and satisfaction in life is helping somebody solve some sort of problem. I am a natural problem solver. I get frustrated when I can't find a solution to something. So when somebody's like, Hey, this is what I'm struggling with. Everything in me lights up. And my next work is helping them do it in a way that doesn't overwhelm them. I find that a lot of people get incredibly overwhelmed. And so I've had to train myself to break it down into those small steps. And uh, it, it's just got to go little by little so that they can add it. I'm a big believer in habit formation and all of these different methods in which you can get there. And if you dig into the, the research, like the book Atomic Habits is such yep. a phenomenal one. Yep. Um, it's fascinating to dig into. Actually, it can be quite challenging to form a habit. And as I've said, my aim is to get somebody to do something for the long run. Mm -hmm. So if we need to do it little by little, then that's what we'll do it. But some people they'll, they're like me. I mean, I'm, I'm somebody I will literally change overnight. You tell me what to do. I'll implement it. I'll stick with it, but not everybody is like that. In fact, most of my clients aren't. Yeah. So, so I kind of attract somebody that needs to do it a little bit more baby step style. Now, Winnie, do you normally do coaching one-on-one -on -one, or are you doing it in a small group dynamic? And how long does the coaching, is it like uh, just if you're buying packages effectively, just to understand a bit more of the business model, um, you know, one-on-one -on -one coaching, group coaching, is it a, a set number of sessions? Is it uh, just basically buy as you go? Like, give me an idea of, of what that looks like from a structured perspective. I do both and I, I see it very fluid. I, it's all based on the needs of the client. So it, it could be budgetary. And in that case, it could lend itself to group coaching for that reason. But I also find that groups are phenomenal. I had a group, right? Or I have a group right now called Beyond Measure. It's one of my greatest joys. And we meet every week as a group and the connections, the bonds that people have made, the accountability they get from that exceeds what I'm able to provide in a way one-on-one -on -one. Mm. and it gives people that opportunity to not just like always be talking to the coach, but talk to one another yeah. and exchange messages and support each other. And then they get to do work together that goes beyond what I'm doing for them as the group. Yeah. But certainly some people thrive in a one-on-one -on -one environment. They feel a little bit more emotionally safe in that sense. And those tend to be one hour sessions. Sure. And even though I'm not, um, a, a a certified therapist or anything. Um, it, it's kind of like a therapy session, <laughs> you know, like it's sitting yeah. down and going through and asking the questions and breaking it down into steps. And it basically feels like that format. 
Yeah. I'm interested to get your take. Uh, fantastic. And thank you for sharing, by the way, uh, because I know there's a lot of our clients that are looking to become wellness coaches and well-being coaches. And I always get a million questions. Do I do a group? Do I do individuals? I thought, do whatever you want. Like you can do both. <laughs> it doesn't have to be one or the other. And it, as you said, I love the way you said it. It should be fluid, right? It should be not only what you say to the client should be based off where they're at, but also some people need a group environment, you know, and some people actually would not do well in a group environment. So I think it's great that you do mm-hmm. both. Um, I'm really interested. You talked a little bit at the beginning about um, uh, some of the the challenges that you had with regards to body image and eating. And I think that this is actually a huge fucking issue across the world, but it's a bigger issue than most people think it is. One, just because of how big it is, but also two, I think a lot of people struggle with body image and and, and eating disorders or, or unhealthy eating habits but they're not diagnosed with it because they're just, they've just grown up with that as their reference point. And we often talk about this idea that everyone's an emotional eater um, and we just eat for different emotions. So I know for me, when I'm, uh, you know, I'm training hard or I'm working towards a goal or I'm doing some sort of, uh, you know, competitive, I'm doing something, I'm eating for a certain emotion. I'm eating for the emotion of, of, of success, or maybe I'm eating to refuel for performance. You're yeah, eating for performance is very different to eating for indulgence. Uh, some people eat because they're stressed. And so I'm really interested to get your take on this. You had obviously your own experience. I've got family members that are going through similar things at the moment. You know, how much does emotion play a role in our decisions around food and some of the, the trauma that we go through with regards to food? And then what would you give us some recommendations for people that are listening that maybe they're struggling at the moment with emotional eating in, in the simplest and more complex form? And then what would you encourage them to do to perhaps you know, take better control of that? It, I think you're absolutely right. I think it's mostly emotional. I mean, I've, there's one person that comes to mind. I'll never forget how he talked about, he just eats food for the fuel and it just burned in my mind. I was like, what do you mean? He's like, I don't care about the taste. I'm eating this for the nutrition, but he's probably the only person I've ever met that at least has admitted that. I think most people want to eat for the experience of it, for the way that it makes them feel physically, mentally, and emotionally. And certainly for me, it's a big emotional tie-in. And I've gone through so many different phases with the way that I've eaten Um, since going vegan and plant-based. I've tried all different variations of it. I've tried the high fat, low carb. I've tried the high carb, low fat. I've tried, you know, all these different iterations. Most recently, based on my cookbook, I did vegan keto for some time and I actually really enjoyed it. And then through the process of doing that, I learned about intuitive eating and that really resonated with me because I recognized through my experience with disordered eating that I was just putting too much judgment and control over food. And that was causing me a lot of stress and actually stress can lead to physical challenges and weight gain. So if you're, if you're feeling stressed, but eating a restricted diet, then it's not going to work out for you. And there's actually a lot of data that says that most diets fail, which was such a foreign concept for me until I started to dig into the research And now I'm just a bigger fan of, of, as I said before, being more fluid. So encouraging people to learn about nutrition, to experiment with food and to really monitor their body Mm -hmm. and then also find ways to tune further inward and less outward. Because I think most people struggle when it comes to food and their body image, because they're so focused externally, Mm -hmm. they're worried about what other people are doing and what other people are thinking of them. And that's just causing them to, to end up in these horrible cycles of self-hatred. And, yeah. you know, we're right now, as we're recording in May, 2021, we're, we're close to the summer season and the bathing suit season, and people are really concerned. And I've seen a lot of talk about that on social media, but I'm also noticing there's a huge movement right now of body acceptance, which is really remarkable and encouraging people to recognize that it doesn't matter what your body looks like. Everybody deserves to go out and enjoy the sun and go swimming and wear a bathing suit. And I think if you allow yourself that freedom and do your best to accept yourself and then establish a truly healthier relationship with the way that you eat, you're ultimately going to feel so much better, no matter what you look like. Yeah. 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 Some, some wise words in there. Uh, there are a couple of things that came to mind. Uh, we don't have a huge amount of time to go through everything, but I am interested to get this take, right? So backstory here, I'm in Bali doing a retreat 
And uh, it wasn't my retreat. I was just speaking at one and there was a, a film and photography crew that were there. And I think they're actually American and they're over uh, from, um, from LA, I think. And they're, uh, they're at this event. And uh, this is the first time I ever heard of a concept called an intuitarian, right? So we we're ordering our meals and uh, yeah, they're saying, hey, any, any, um, any meals? And, and uh, one of the guys ordered, I think, a vegan meal. I said, oh, you're vegan. He says, no, 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 I'm an intuitarian. I said, what the fuck does that mean? He says, I, I'm in, I eat intuitively. I was like, so sometimes you intuitively feel like a vegan meal and sometimes intuitively feel like a steak. He says, yeah, basically that was it, right? No, I love that premise. I've met a lot of people though, that if I told them, hey, become an intuitarian, they go, I intuitively feel like I should have ice cream right now. And so <laughs> how do you balance? You know, there's obviously for a lot of people, the reason why they're overweight and for a lot of people, the reason why they struggle to lose the weight Let's forget about obviously the emotional conditioning and all the other stuff that goes into that. They lack willpower. They're, they're not great at discipline and they, they, they struggle to, to put in place those, those, those structures into their lives, which to be fair, uh, you know, in some cases they need some cases they don't, right? But let's be fair, you, you, you gain weight traditionally because you eat too much relative to how much you move, right? So if, you, if you're gaining weight it's because you're consuming more than you're, than you're using, this is obviously a generalization. So don't, don't crucify me for it, mm -hmm. but get the idea. For someone that is out of control in their eating at the moment, um, you know, do you do you phase that in in terms of okay, well, we're going to start by putting some basic building blocks in place and build a higher level of self awareness, and then once you have a higher level of self awareness, then we can look at intuitive eating. Because if you if you you know if you ask a kid at the candy store what they want intuitively, they're going to say, "I want all the candy." So how do you balance that out as well? Because I think the concept is amazing. Uh, and I think listening into that is really important. I also see you can run the risk, though. It's like a PT on a morning saying, hey, intuitively, do you feel like going to the gym? Well, no, I really intuitively feel like staying in bed right now. So wh wh what's your what's your take on that? I love that. And I had a lot of similar questions. I'm still learning about this because I, I just started digging into intuitive eating in the past couple of years. And I had the same questions. It felt really strange, but I also had to realize that I've grown up in diet culture. Most yeah. of us have. And so we're so far away from our own intuition mm -hmm. and you're exactly right. We have to start by examining what we're currently doing and what our goals are, but ultimately asking why. Mm -hmm. And I found that a lot of my goals were tied into why's that didn't really resonate with me, but I thought that that's the way that I needed to look and act and do all of these things. And it, it's been interesting because I found a lot of healing through trying different ways of eating yeah. and noticing how I felt, you know, and, and what really felt like something I wanted to continue doing versus dreading. For example, I, for a while and a huge, um, I'm sure you noticed this, the time that you were eating plant-based, what there was a big rise in emphasis on high fruit diets, fruitarian diets. And at the, it was actually big in Australia. There was some very well-known people based there. And on YouTube, it was all about this fruitarian, you know, high carb diet. And I thought that, that was the way to eat. And I did that a uh, way of eating for some time, but I realized I didn't love fruit that much, yeah. but I was eating all that fruit because I got some results from it. And people were telling me like, that was the best way. That was the most nutritious way. You know, like I was just kind of brainwashed yeah. and I found myself going away from it naturally and then started to get in this place of almost shame for not eating that way mm -hmm. and self-judgment. Like, Oh, I really should be eating that way, but I don't want to. And that's where the intuition comes in. Yeah. I didn't want to, yeah. I was only doing it because other people yeah. were telling me to yeah. versus on the opposite end of the spectrum. When I tried the vegan keto diet, which is high fat, low carb, that felt easy for me. I love eating fat. You know, like a lot of people are, are so anti-fat but wow, avocado and coconut and macadamia nuts and all those foods. I was so excited. I couldn't get enough of it. It was a completely different experience. Yeah. And then I could see that my body was into that, but yeah. now I, I'm not fully keto. I, I kind of err on that uh, side, but I also enjoy carbs. I enjoy sweet yeah. potatoes and I enjoy rice. So I have those yeah. and that's where I found the balance. So sometimes you have to go to the extremes to really understand the balance for yourself yes. based on where you're pulled to. And I think that's how you tap into your intuitive eating.
I love that. I think that's a beautiful point as well for us to uh, to segue. How can we find out a little bit more about you in the well-being space? Um, where, where do we go from here? Well, my podcast, this might get uncomfortable every uh, three times a week. My co-host and I talk about these things. So if you're enjoying this, we yeah. talk about all different elements of living uh, emotionally, specifically very much into the mental health side of things as well. Um, and then my website, WhitneyLauritson.com is my hub. So if you want to get in touch, if you want to find anything that I've done, it's there. Awesome. We'll put it all up into the show notes and I can't wait for a second version of this chat as well. All around yeah, the market. Thank you so much for the wellbeing conversation. Um, and uh, for everyone playing along at home, make sure you leave us a comment and a review, go and check out Whitney's stuff as well. And until we see you live or online, be bold, have fun, go make an impact in the world and we'll see you on the wild side. Hey.